Welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about the works of one of the greatest American Gothic writers, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and what we're going to be doing specifically is trying to connect some of the Gothic tropes in Poe's work to what will later develop um, in uh, what we now call weird fiction. Right, so we're going to be looking at four of Poe's works. Um, an essay called The Philosophy of Composition, which mostly attempts to describe his process in writing his most famous poem, The Raven, uh, which has often been called uh, the greatest bad poem in the history of American literature. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, we're going to be looking at another poem called The City and the Sea, uh, which on the one hand provides a really good example of certain tropes that will become common in the weird, but is also regarded as a direct influence on H.P. Lovecraft's Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and we'll be looking at two short stories. Most of the time we're going to be spending on The Fall of the House of Usher, which is probably the most classically gothic of Poe's tales. But we're also going to be looking briefly at The Mask of the Red Death, because in particular, the final encounter between Prince Prospero and his guests and the reveler representing the Red Death um, really do, uh, really does uh, prefigure much of what's going to happen in the weird. So, let's start by talking a little bit about Poe's work. This is the man himself one Edgar Allan Poe, and I, want to, I first want to focus on the various gothic tropes that we're going to see, particularly in the short stories. First and foremost, haunted castles. Right? We talked last time about uh, the setting of a gothic tale. It is often you know, a haunted castle, a ruined abbey, um, some sort of imposing structure that is at the same time claustrophobic. So the House of Usher, particularly in the way it mirrors the psychoses of its inhabitants, is a classic example of a gothic haunted castle. Though it's also doing some things that are a little unusual. We'll get to that when we talk about the House of Usher. Prince Prospero's Abbey that he uses to escape from the possibility of contamination by the Red Death is another example of the haunted castle, right? The prince is unable to wall himself off in a conventional way from the disease that's raging outside of his little retreat. Paranoia in the characters, madness, we have Roderick Usher's hypersensitivity paired with his sister's um, almost near complete insensitivity. Right. We'll look at this a little more specifically when we start digging into the tale. Right? But we notice that Usher himself um, is suffering from an over-refinement of the senses, right? while his sister is nearly completely unresponsive to her environment. We also see this uh, gothic paranoia in Prince Prospero's fear of disease and contamination. Right? He does not want to expose himself to the danger of disease presented by the Red Death, hence the walling of himself in the Abbey. Now, the power of a gothic tale is very much predicated on the encounter of the protagonist with the uncanny. Now, we talked a little bit about the uncanny last time, um, but let's briefly review where the concept comes from and exactly what it means. Um, the term is first used, it's actually a translation from the German unheimlich, which means unhomely, right? that is sort of difficult to house, um, difficult to contained within your own conceptual framework. Um, and it's used by Sigmund Freud in an essay called The Uncanny, 19, published in 1919. And the uncanny is a sense of simultaneous 
familiarity and attraction coupled with a kind of strangeness and repulsion, right? So you are faced with something that is both like you and attractive to you, but is also in some fundamental way different from you and repulsive to you. So just about every Gothic text, and indeed every weird text, is predicated on some kind of encounter with the uncanny, right? You, you run into something that, hey, this reminds me of me, but there's something off about it. There's something I can't quite uh, house here. And finally, we're going to be talking about the doppelganger or the dark double. Right. Doppelganger is another German word. It means something like double goer. And a doppelganger is essentially an alter ego or a counterpart of you onto which all of your faults, all of your wickedness, your sin, your evil um, is projected. Right? Everything you don't want to see in yourself you project onto the double, the doppelganger. The Usher twins in the house, the, in the fall of the House of Usher, um, seem to fit the bill uh, for doppelgangers. And one could argue as well, perhaps the house is a kind of double for the family. Particularly when you think about the fact that the word house means both dwelling place and a family lineage. Uh, you could also probably argue that the reveler dressed as the Red Death is a kind of doppelganger for Prince Prospero. But we'll, sort of, we'll get to that maybe by the time we're finished with all of this. So let's start by talking about the, philo the theories that Poe lays out in the philosophy of composition. Right, so this is an essay published in 1846. It first appears in Graham's magazine, Poe had actually written it um, as a lecture he could give on, uh, you know, speaking tours to capitalize on his popularity as a poet, specifically on the popularity of the Raven. And indeed, the essay is primarily concerned with the techniques that Poe used in composing The Raven. Right, so on the one hand, it's a kind of explica uh, explication of methods used in the poem. And purports to discuss sort of how you could write a similar sort of poem yourself. Now, one thing that's interesting about Poe's essay. Poe is coming sort of at the tail end of Romanticism, and the Romantics tended to favor what they called imagination, right, often spelled in all capital letters, over the process of reason. Right, what was, what was most important in the creation of art was using your imagination to come up with something totally new, right? To completely alter the sensory stimuli that you took in. What Poe stresses in the philosophy of composition, on the other hand, is the way that imagination and reason work together. Now, in the Gothic and the weird, products of imagination will actually work to destroy or erode Reasons. So I think it's important that we set this relationship up here early at the beginning of the class. Now, the process that Poe outlines in the essay bears almost no resemblance to the actual process he employed in writing the poem. In fact, the poem is largely um, an imitation of a very similar poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the title of which 
um, escapes me. That's something like the courtship of Lady Strangeboro or something of that nature. At any rate, it has the same stanza pattern, same rhyme scheme, same meter. And what Poe is actually doing in The Raven is proving that he can write in that same formulaic meter. But the essay itself is probably intended originally as a joke or a hoax, so it's not really so much a clue to Poe's direct writing process as it might appear to be. Um, we will talk about what is valuable in it in a moment. One interesting thing to note about the way that the essay is constructed, though, is that it actually mirrors the structure of the raven. Right? The bird in the poem does not appear until the seventh stanza. And Poe doesn't mention the poem directly in the essay until the seventh paragraph. So it's clear that the raven is very much on his mind here as he's writing, right? And here we have the friendly smiling mascot for the Baltimore Ravens. Um, now, just a short tangent here. Um, I always get a little bit cheesed off about the association between Poe and Baltimore, right? Baltimore names their football team after Poe. They have, um, you know, Edgar Allan Poe themed bars all over the place, right? There's all this Poe stuff in Baltimore. Now, Poe lived a really kind of peripatetic existence, right? Um, he wandered all up and down cities along the East Coast. Uh, he lived in New York for a while. He lived in Philadelphia. He lived actually probably more in Richmond than any place else. Um, he was born in Boston. The only thing he really did in Baltimore was die. And because he died there, Baltimore gets to lay eternal claim to him. So, well, I guess good for you, Baltimore. End of rant, end of tangent. So, what we can extract from the philosophy of composition that has nothing to do with the techniques employed to write The Raven are some of Poe's thoughts on what makes an appropriate subject for a poem or a short tale. Right? One thing to note right, is that he does say that a tale, like a, a good poem or a good tale, should be consumable in a single sitting. Right? So we're talking about a kind of concentration of incident in both cases. As far as the subject is concerned, Poe writes, beauty is the sole legitimate province of the poem. When indeed men speak of beauty, they mean precisely not a quality as is supposed, but an effect. They refer, in short, to that intense and pure elevation of soul, not of intellect or of heart, which is experienced in consequence of contemplating the beautiful. So we have here Poe figuring, prefiguring, certain tendencies of aestheticism and decadence. Right? The idea that art is not meant to teach you anything, right? It's not supposed to make you smarter. It's not supposed to make you more moral. It's not supposed to make you a better person. What it is supposed to give you is this kind of transcendent experience of beauty, right? It elevates your consciousness for a moment as you contemplate it. But you're no smarter than you're no smarter after you've read the poem than you were before you read it. You're not a better person. It doesn't teach you anything. It doesn't reform your manners or morals, right? It exists solely to be beautiful. Now, Poe goes on to talk about fitting subjects for the beautiful, right? Regarding, then, beauty as my province, my next question referred to the tone of its highest manifestation. And all experience has shown that this tone is one of sadness. Beauty of whatever kind, in its supreme development, invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears. Melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all the poetical tones. Now, evocation of sadness may seem like rather a strange position for a writer who's best known for tales of horror and suspense uh, to be going for, right? 
but most of Poe's tales do involve a sense of the loss of something valuable. Freedom, a loved one, right? A cherished family name or heirloom, right? Now, I think we also need to think about what Poe means by melancholy, because this is also particularly important in the development of aestheticism and decadence. Now, melancholy isn't just ordinary sadness, right? It's not just, oh, I don't feel myself today. I feel a little bit teary-eyed. Right? I saw something or read something that made me feel a little bit blue. Melancholy is a kind of all-encompassing sadness. But it's not quite depression either. Because melancholy is aesthetically pleasurable, all-encompassing sadness. Right? When you're feeling melancholy, right, your limbs are languid, you cannot bring yourself to stir, but there's something beautiful and pleasurable about the whole thing, right? You are wallowing in a kind of exquisite sadness. Now, setting as an aid to creating mood in Poe is actually a really big deal. We've talked a little bit already about the kinds of places he sets up uh, for his characters to have their bizarre and terrifying supernatural experiences in. But this is what he has to say himself on the subject. And this is the library or the study in which the morbid student in the raven imagines angels waving sensors of, in, you know, sensors of burning incense around his uh, chamber door and what have you. So Poe writes, it has always appeared to me that a close circumscription of space is absolutely necessary to the effect of insulated incident. It has the force of a frame to a picture. It has an indisputable moral power in keeping concentrated the attention and, of course, must not be confounded with mere unity of place. Right? So I'm not sure if you're familiar with what, you, with what the term unity of place means. Right? This is one of the old Aristotelian artistic unities. Right? Um, Aristotle in the Poetics argues that a good play should take place or should focus on one single line of action. Right? He calls this simply unity of action. Now later writers, particularly in France in the 17th and 18th centuries, will derive further ideas of unity from Aristotle. Unity of time, that the action in a play should take place in a 24-hour period. And unity of place, that all of the action in the play, story, poem, what have you, should take place in a single location. Now Poe is arguing that just having the tale take place in a single location isn't enough to create the kind of powerful effect he's going for, right? It has to be in a closely circumscribed, that is, an enclosed, small, claustrophobic space. Say, a single chamber. A walled-off abbey. A crumbling old house. Oh, wow, that just set the mood beautifully. I, I hope you heard that thunder. Um, I'm not looking forward to going back outside now. Right, so, where was I? Um, so yeah, so claustrophobia is an important element in creating the proper Gothic atmosphere. Now I wanted you to read the short poem, The City and the Sea. Um, this is actually written quite a bit before the philosophy of composition. It first appears in 1831. And it was originally entitled The Doomed City, then The City of Sin, and acquired its present title when republished in 1845, so shortly before 
the philosophy of composition first appeared. So this is a poem that went through many different um, revisions and sort of Poe is going for a slightly different effect in each version. Now by the time we get to The City and the Sea, right, we're looking at a poem that is inspired by historical and mythological accounts of lost and sunken cities. So there are elements of Atlantis here, there are elements of the destruction of Babylon and the Book of Revelation, um, the biblical prophecy of Ezekiel, um, who discusses the destruction of the Phoenician city of Tyre. And we can also detect a source in American literature, in early American literature, in the work of the Puritan preacher and politician John Winthrop. Um, this is a model of Christian charity, in which he talks about the need to build a shining city on the hill in, Amer in, in the Americas, right, as an example to good Christians everywhere. Well, Poe has then reversed that and given us a wicked, sinful city sunken beneath the sea. This poem is also part of a vogue for what was called Orientalism in the late 18th and 19th centuries. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Some of you might already be familiar with this term. Um, it is uh, the, the best known theorist of this particular philosophical position um, was the Palestinian American literary critic Edward Said. And Said discussed Orientalism as a sort of Western way of talking about the East that tended to frame the East or the Orient in terms that made it sort of alien or other to the West. So if you're looking, for example, at the way a 19th century Englishman, right, at the height of the empire, describes himself, right, well, I'm an Englishman, I'm hardworking, I'm chaste, and I'm temperate. So he looks then maybe at someone from India or from the Arabian Peninsula North Africa, China, Japan, and he thinks, all right, if I have these qualities in myself, then these foreign people, these alien people, must have the opposite qualities. So if I'm hardworking, they're lazy. If I'm temperate, they are easily tempted. If I'm chaste, they're promiscuous. Now, this also turns the East as kind of exotic other to the West into a kind of consumable good, right? Something that Westerners can latch on to and take home for themselves, right? I'll give you an example of this. This painting by the French artist Eugène Delacroix, it's called The Death of Sardanopolis. And what it is, is a depiction of um, a tale of an ancient Assyrian king by the name of Sardanopolis, who saw his enemies approaching his city and knew that there was no way he was going to defeat them in battle. The city was doomed. So he encouraged his people to essentially have one giant, massive blowout party slash orgy all across Nineveh while they waited for the death blow to fall. Now this is typical of the way Westerners have since depicted Easterners, right? We see in this painting, right, the king is just lounging languidly on his bed. He has his hand on his crown. He's watching all of the debauchery unfold around him, right? There are half-naked women lying about, men chasing after them, men killing them, right? This mixture of kind of sex and death.
right? The violence and barbarism of the action in the scene are contrasted with the wealth and splendor of its setting. I would encourage you to look for similar tropes in the city and the sea. We can see that the state of civilization in Delacroix's painting is quite high. There's all this fancy stuff around, all this beautiful art. But coupled with that advanced state of civilization is a complete indifference to human suffering. Right? Sardanopoulos is lying on his bed. There's a dead woman lying across the foot of it. There's another woman being stabbed to death right in front of him here. And it doesn't affect him. He doesn't care. Right? Civilization advances to the point where human feeling, natural human feeling, disappears. The city in the poem, as in this painting, is also presented as something that is uncanny, right? Poe uses the line, it resembles nothing that is ours, right? We know what a city is. We know what a city is supposed to look like. But there is something in the poem, there's something about the city in the poem, right, that does not quite resemble our conception of what a city is or what a city is supposed to be. And finally, the city in the poem has reached its end point, right? It's static, it's sterile, it's not going to advance any further, it's not going to degenerate any further. It's reached a state of perfect decadence. Now, I'd like to move from the city and the sea to consideration of the two tales that I asked you to read. So let's start with the fall of the House of Usher, which in particular focuses on the inhabitants of a seemingly sentient house. Right? There's a depiction of the house, and we see the way the artist is drawn, and it looks almost as though there's a face on the front of it. We can see that in the way the narrator, Roderick Usher's nameless childhood friend, refers to the city when he first arrives. Right? I looked upon the scene before me. Upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul which I can compare to no earthly sensation than to the afterdream of the reveler upon opium, the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping of the veil. So first thing to note here are the human-like terms in which the house is described. Right? This isn't the only place um, in the story in which the house is described almost as though it's alive or as though it's a person, but um, it's sort of one of the first prominent examples, right? So the vacant eye-like windows, right? So the house is watching. And the whole atmosphere created here is oppressive. Bleak walls, rank sedges, white trunks of decayed trees. And the impression that the whole scene gives to the narrator is of coming down from a drug high, right? Coming down from a high on opium. So, been flying high above the clouds and now I come back down to earth and this is the bleak, oppressive reality that I'm faced with. And that's one thing to remember in a Gothic text. When you, when you always pay very close attention to setting, to location, right? Place is intended to be oppressive. It's intended to make you feel closed in, trapped. That's what the house is doing. It's all behaving almost as though it's watching, right? Now we talked a little bit about 
the role of madness and paranoia in the text as well. Right, we have Roderick Usher, the inhabitant of the house, and Usher is suffering from some sort of strange illness, right? To quote Poe, he entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady. It was, he said, a constitutional and a family evil, and for which he despaired to find a remedy. A mere nervous affection, he immediately added, which would undoubtedly soon pass off. It displayed itself in a host of unnatural sensations. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. The most insipid food was alone endurable. He could wear only garments of a certain texture. The odors of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light. And there were but peculiar sounds, and these from stringed instruments, which did not inspire him with horror. So what's happened to Roderick Usher here right, is that his senses have become so refined and so intense that he cannot handle sensory input of, a nor of even a normal magnitude, right? And we know also that he's a poet, he's a musician. So what we have here is a figure of the decadent artist who is no longer able to enjoy, to take any pleasure in the sensory impressions that he has cultivated and refined over time. He can't enjoy art, he can't enjoy food, he can't enjoy really any normal human pleasures any longer. His madness is a result of his ultra-refined sensibilities and his cultivation. Now if we compare that to his sister, the Lady Madeline, right? Lady Madeline's malady is precisely the opposite of her brothers. Right? The disease of the Lady Madeline had long baffled the skill of her physicians. A settled apathy, a gradual wasting away of the person, and frequent, although transient, affections of a partially cataleptical character were the, were the unusual diagnosis. Hitherto, she had steadily borne up against the pressure of her malady and had not betaken herself finally to bed. But on the closing end of the evening of my arrival at the house, she succumbed, as her brother told me, with inexpressible agitation, to the prostrating power of the destroyer. And I heard that the glimpse I had obtained of her person would thus probably be the last I should obtain, that the lady, at least while living, would be seen by me no more. So one thing that Poe does that's actually really pretty interesting here is the way he directly juxtaposes Roderick's agitation, right, his intense feeling against the sister's complete lack of feeling. Right? He has absorbed all of her ability to feel, to sense the world around her. She no longer sees, hears, smells, tastes anything. She's catatonic, basically. Whereas Roderick sees, hears, smells, tastes too much. So the two become kind of mirror image, like negative mirror images of one another. Now to talk here about the shock of the uncanny, right, that moment of attraction and repulsion, of recognition and alienation. To start with the fall of the House of Usher, it occurs when Lady Madeline, who has been walled up alive in the tomb, emerges to confront her brother in the narrator, right? As in the superhuman energy of his utterance, 
there had been found the potency of a spell. The huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the work of the rushing gust. But then without those doors, there did stand the lofty and shrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood on her white robes, and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment, she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold. Then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother, and in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse, and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. So the thing that appears at the door is, recognizably, the Lady Madeline, but not in a form that her one-time acquaintances can quite accommodate, right? It's clearly Lady Madeline, but she's wearing a burial shroud, her white robes are covered in blood, She's thin, right? She's almost like a kind of spirit of famine here. The, the description that's given of her is quite similar to the description that we often see in folklore and in 19th century literature of the vampire and other species of revenant, right? For a rev the revenant, for those of you who don't know, um, is a term that's used for any kind of spirit that returns from the dead, right? particularly uh, to plague or pester its living relatives. Now, the other thing to note here, again, is the way the house itself is uncanny. It's still described as a living thing here, right? The huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws. So there is a lot of language here of hunger, of famine, of devouring. As Lady Madeline finally takes her brother with her back to the grave. Now, the walling up of living things is actually a fairly common trope um, in Poe. I don't know if any of you have read um, The Black Cat, for example, or Lygia. We have uh, very similar themes uh, across several of these works. And that's an image of Lady Madeline, fresh from the grave, forcing her way back into the house. Now, we're not going to spend nearly as much time here in The Mask of the Red Death. Um, but I do want to point to the uncanny moment in that text as well, right? This particular text is largely concerned with Prince Prospero's fear of contamination. And the fear of loss of identity, the fear of loss of one's own personhood, is a fairly common trope in Gothic texts. So the way it's expressed in this particular text right, is fear of disease, right? That the Red Death comes and essentially disintegrates the person. Right? The, one's personal integrity is violated. And I'm not talking integrity like reputation. I'm talking integrity like, you know, the very structure of your body is violated by the intrusion of the Red Death. So at the very end of the tale, then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment where this reveler who was dared to dress as the Red Death has appeared. And, seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness untenanted by any tangible form. So what looks like a human being in a costume, when they tear the costume away, 
has nothing underneath it. Right? This both attractive and repellent figure without the costume completely vanishes. And that's when the revelers all start dropping dead from the Red Death. The shock of the uncanny The madness that results from it, the extreme emotional and intellectual reaction, the way it unhinges the reason, this is going to be a major theme when we get to the actual early 20th century weird. So I want you to keep all of this in mind as you continue to read. And I have some reading questions for you uh, for next time as well. We're going to be looking at two texts by Washington Irving uh, taken from a longer work called The Sketchbook. You're going to be looking at The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is probably Irving's most famous work, and it's a lot less cartoony than you're likely going to expect it to be. And also a short piece called The Mutability of Literature. So first, I want you to you know, read the mutability, the mutability of Literature first. It's a much more minor piece. Um, but thematically, it works quite well with a lot of the things we're talking about. I want you to pay attention to a kind of absurd conversation that Irving has, or that Irving's narrator anyway, has with a book in that text. And I want you to think about which aspects of the Gothic this essay seems to adopt and critique. Now, when you get to The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, I also want you to pay attention to the way Ichabod Crane interacts with the world around him, right? What seems to be his primary response to any kind of external stimulus? And why does it say in the text that he has the dilating powers of an anaconda? What does this tell us about him? Third, think about the setting of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is rural. It's a small village rather than a haunted castle. And I want you to think about how it reflects Gothic literary values, despite not having that sort of castle at its centerpiece. And finally, I want you to look at Irving's writing style and compare it to Poe's. How clear is it? When we look at Poe and at Irving, how easy is it for us to get a sense of physical description or of clear lines of action. And why do you think that might matter? All right, so uh, that does it for this particular lecture. Um, next, as we said, will be Washington Irving. Um, and we'll see you then.